When it comes to selecting tools and tool paths for milling operations, we can often feel that modern tool paths like trichoidal milling, you know, the dynamic clears, the adaptive clears of the world are always the best solution. But when does using more traditional tool paths and insertable tooling become the better option when removing large amounts of material? What's up guys, Ian Sandusky from Lakewood Machine and Tool back here again for Practical Machinist. And today on Shop Talk, we're gonna be doing a little tool test to see which kind of tool paths are actually the most effective when it comes to clearing away a lot of material really fast. But before we do, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Let's get into it. Okay guys, so the first tool we're gonna use here is that quarter or a three eighths solid carbide end mill. We did program a little bit of relief into this. You can see we just milled that away real quick, just so these tools have a little bit of an entry spot. Uh, we didn't wanna risk breaking anything while we're trying to test this. So there is a bit of air movement that is useless. You can see that is using a trichoidal, trichoidal tool path. Um, that's taking a nice, I believe it's about a 50 thou step over there. We'll put all the information up on the screen here. You can see that's actually doing a very, very good job. We're getting big chips coming off that. We're using the full flute engagement. And the reason why these trichoidal and adaptive clear and dynamic tool paths can be so good is that look at that finish. This is technically a roughing tool path. You know, we're taking quite a, material, quite a bit of material out of there very quickly. And we can see that that finish is actually very, very good, not only on the walls, but on the floors. Again, this is a 1018 cold roll steel, just a piece of uh, Blanchard ground we had on the shelf there. You can see this is effective. So now that we have more of that floor released and we can uh, we can see more of it, you can see that's actually a, an incredibly impressive finish, both on the walls and on the floors. Um, this is making quick work of this. I would say this is an effective tool path. You know, it's not a matter of not being effective. It's what's go going to be the fastest material removal rate at the lowest cost um, that we're looking at here. Okay, so for tool two here, this is our seven flute solid carbide 3 8 end mill. Um, again, we're gonna see a little bit of air movement here, but that's more just for our safety and the safety of the tool as we're doing a first off tool test uh, rather than proving this out and running it twice. So you can see this is gonna move into the cut. This is gonna be taking a smaller step over, but with a much higher spindle speed. Uh, we're about 4,000 RPM faster, but while the old tool is feeding at about, you know, 80 inches per minute, this one's in the 220 inches per minute range. Um, again, you can see this is making very, very short work of this. This is doing that very fast back feed. That's one of the key components of a adaptive clear dynamic milling tool path is that as it's cutting, it's getting as much fluid engagement and as much cut as it can while maintaining that chip thickness and then it back feeds. So that is a full rapid back feed. Now you can see, if you look at those chips that are all over the table there, we're seeing nice blue chips. We uh, are cutting this just with air. We have an air line hooked up here. But even with that, you can see that those chips are turning blue, which means all the heat is coming away in the chip. That's what we want. We don't want the, the, the heat being in the workpiece. We don't want the heat moving into the tool because that's when you get welding and galling. But you can see this is making some quite short work of this. Again, really nice finishes both on the floor and on the walls. Now for this tool, because we don't have the same cut length and this isn't a reduced neck tool, this isn't going to be a complete apples to apples comparison as you know, this only is going about half inch deep as opposed to three quarter, but the concept remains the same.
Again, let's look at that floor. Let's look at those wall thickness or wall finishes. This is a very, very nice looking pocket. While this is technically a roughing toolpath, in a lot of cases, you may be able to use this as a single toolpath. You know, unless you're doing something very, very critical where those uh, dimensions need to be exactly where you need them. You know, if this is a uh, pocket that maybe has 15 thou tolerance, you may be able to get away with just doing this because those walls tend to be very straight. They don't tend to taper much, especially when you have a uh, short, rigid tool like this in very rigid tool holding like we have with the Iskar body and um, call it in there. But that is our seven flute end mill. It's, uh, it's fairly impressive how quickly that milled that away with the finishes it produced. Now we're gonna move on to that insertable end mill. This has those tiny little triangular inserts. Um, this is an exchangeable head. Again, 3 8 diameter. Now this is crazy. I was very shocked when they told us to do this. We're gonna have a ramping entry here again, just to make sure we're being safe. But we are gonna be taking a 300 thou step over at 100 thou deep with a 3 8 cutter. And you can see that thing is just plowing into there. Our spindle speed is not slowing down. We're not bogging down the machine, you know, because we're using such a small tool here. Again, the rigid tool holding here is impressive. Um, I was expecting this thing to blow up fairly quickly based on the speeds and feeds we were given. And you can see that's taking a huge cut. Now, this is where those traditional pocket tool paths may be the more appropriate solution. You can see again, we're going down another hundred thou here. Those inserts, we're taking a full cut. Look how quickly that pocket is opening up. Now, again, when we compare this to something like an adaptive clear or dynamic milling tool path, our floor finishes here are actually very impressive. I was shocked at how good they look, but our wall finishes may not be as nice as using a dynamic uh, tool path. But when we're talking about straight material removal rates, that may not matter. Um, if I'm just hogging out this pocket, I can go in with a finished tool path, you know, even with two passes or three passes with a spring pass and clean up those walls in, you know, 20, 30 seconds at most. So when we compare how long it took those adaptive clear dynamic tool paths to hog this out in comparison with this tiny little insertable end mill, you can see already, we're gonna have a huge cost savings and um, a huge cycle time reduction, especially if we're hogging out 10, 20, 100, 200 of these pockets. Uh, it's going to be much, much faster. So we can see we're going into the last tool, uh, last pass here. We're going right down to three quarter inch. You can see that this is a far faster approach than the trichoidal milling tool path. Now the concern of course, um, one of the advantages when it comes to the adaptive clear or dynamic milling approaches is it depends on the material. For a nice cutting material like 1018 steel or you know aluminum or copper, you know something soft or something not crazy, this is a great way to get it out. When it comes to something super hard, like an Inconel or a Pastelloy, you may have to use something like those radial chip thinning tool paths to keep from work hardening the piece. In our case here, we're not really concerned about that and all the heat's coming out anyway. Again, we're cutting this dry just with air. So again, it, you have, can't draw too many conclusions with things like Pastelloy and that with this. So finally, we're moving on to the insertable head or the exchangeable head end mill. Um, this is again three eighths. We're gonna put all the information up on the screen here. This is about shock, you guys. This thing absolutely rips. Again, we're starting with a ramp just to make sure we're being safe. We don't want to snap this thing immediately. But watch what this is doing. Watch the depth of cut and step over we're gonna get with this exchangeable hat ML. It's going down. You can see how deep that cut is. We're going just about full flute engagement. That is a full slotting cut. Again, just with air, no coolant. Um, it's crazy the material removal rates we're getting in comparison 
with those dynamic milling tool paths on this. And frankly, guys, the wall finish on that, you can see it's not even that bad. Um, we're not getting chatter. We're not getting deflection. I mean, I'm sure there's some kind of taper in there. Um, you probably want some kind of finish pass. But again, if we're talking straight material removal rates, you can see that that is exponentially faster. Even going down to the second pass here, again, we're using that little ramping tool path uh, to enter just to make sure we're not gonna snap it. We don't wanna plunge. But once again, we're going full flute engagement, full slotting cut with this exchangeable head end mill. And again, here's the thing, we're using the full flute engagement. If we have to, if we end up burning out those uh, flutes on there and we have to pay for a new cutting head on this, we're only paying for a very small piece of carbide in comparison with a full uh, standard milling cutter, you know, a solid carbide. And look how quickly we're gonna get this thing straight down to three quarter. I believe this is going down a half inch, uh, maybe a little bit beyond, you know, three quarter divided by three, whatever that may be, my brain's not working. But look at those blue chips. Again, we're getting heat coming off in the chip. We're not having great chip evacuation in there right now, but that's just where we have the airline set up. Um, so please don't judge it on that merit. But again, look at those blue chips, all the heat coming off in the chip. Again, no coolant. We're not seeing any welding of chips to the cutter. We're not seeing that cutter bind up and snap. It's just plowing straight through it. Um, I think the results speak for itself when we talk time, how much time we're saving with this Iskar cutter in comparison with using a dynamic milling or adaptive clear tool path. So there you have it guys. I hope you enjoyed this. This was a very, very crazy result in my opinion. Thank you Iskar for providing this super high-end tooling to make this happen. But it goes to show, you know, when I got the speeds and feeds from Iskar for these, I thought they were optimistic. Um, you know, in a standard tooling application, you know, you can always get these speeds and feeds, but whether they actually survive the tool test or not is a different thing. And clearly we can see they did. Even that one insertable with those tiny, tiny inserts, I was shocked at how quickly that went. It goes to show that there's, we're not saying there's not a place for something like a dynamic mill or an adaptive clear. It's that if you're always relying on it or you're always thinking it's the best option, you may actually be losing cycle time or you know material removal rates that you could have at a higher level with a more traditional tool path with something like an insertable end mill or an exchangeable head. Um, when it comes to speeds and feeds we used, you know, this is just a tool test. You're gonna have to determine whether those tiny little inserts are gonna survive long enough to make it worth your while. Personally, I took a look at them. These things are still mint. Uh, I was very impressed with the way that these things are holding up. And you gotta remember, it's a matter of comparing using the full flute length on a solid carbide end mill the cost of that end mill and the life you're gonna get out of it versus something like that insertable or exchangeable, he exchangeable head, where instead of paying for the whole piece of carbide, you're paying for a piece of carbide this big, which means it's cheaper. Or in the case of that solid body insertable end mill, you're only paying for a piece of carbide this big times three. That means, and they have multiple edges. So that means when it comes to you know, your tool life and stuff, yeah, you may be switching the inserts more often, you may be turning them, you may be replacing them more often, but you need to evaluate those costs and the cost savings from the actual cycle time you're gonna get out of it. In any case, guys, I'd like to know your thoughts below. What do you think about using more traditional tool paths versus tricoidal, uh, dynamic, you know, these AI powered tool paths when do you think it's a good idea to try to stick to traditional? When do you think it's a good idea to use the modern ones? And is there a time where you probably should have made that other decision? I'd love to know in the comments below. As always, make sure you like, subscribe, and turn on notifications below to make sure you never miss a video. Thank you very much for watching, guys. You take care.